first off, we have Didi Pere. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced your your last name correctly, Didi. Uh, I don't know that we you did great. Right. Oh, yes. awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, so she's a senior product marketing manager for Cradlepoint. Uh, during her 20 years in networking, Didi has had a passion for marketing technology solutions. Uh, surrounding 5G and LTE enterprise networking, security, smart grid, Internet of Things. Uh, prior to Cradle Point, she worked in product, solution, content, and enablement marketing for Cisco and Forescout. Dee Dee is based in Cradle Point's Los Gatos, California office. That is a heck of a resume, Dee Dee. That is awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jacob Perry, right here, oh. is our uh, tech lab manager here at RCN Technologies. He oversees all of the support, installation, technology, uh, management services provided by RCN out of our headquarters here in Knoxville. And then lastly, I'm Mark Indelicato. Uh, I'm the content marketing specialist and your moderator for the day, uh, also streaming out of RCN HQ. Uh, Didi, Jacob, how are you guys doing today? Doing great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Glad to have you both here with us. I'll have you start us off. Uh, what are POTS lines and why are businesses replacing them? Sure. And it's, you know, to start, the uh, acronym of POTS is plain old telephone system. You'll also hear it referred to as PSTN. It's like public switch telephone um, network or something along those lines. And so, you know, basically we've been hearing about POTS lines being replaced for decades now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the advent of the internet, um, you know, basically the POTS lines have been analog in nature and to really take advantage of all things on the internet and really having that connection um, you know, everything needed to switch over to digital. And so since the 90s, um, we've been hearing about POTS lines being replaced. Uh, you know, a lot of it happened in terms of the voice and fax capabilities um, that you could do originally with PSTN and POTS. But at the same time, it was all it started off with communications you, you know, being switched over, um, a lot of the communications vendors such as Cisco, Avaya, Nortel, you know, a number of, of um, communications giants um, did make that transition from PSTN over to um, to to digital and, and having that. And so the first wave was really about making that communications shift over to digital. So what's right. happened since then um, you know, what we're seeing is that there are still some legacy equipment out there. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that, that um, mm -hmm. there will be, um, you know, that just have not switched over from the reliability of the, the PSTN. That's one thing it was built very solidly, but it just right. didn't have any room for growth or more performance as well. So, Jacob, in, um, other thoughts that you're, you're experiencing? No, no. I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's one of those things where um, it, it's really not that complicated of a subject um, because it, it is it is this old data data technology that is very, very reliable. Um, and I completely agree with you. One of the biggest problems is, is that, you know, um, it wasn't scalable. Um, you're not able to increase that performance, but it is really difficult to find something that is as reliable as just a solid copper wire. Yeah, I mean, it's been around since the 1880s, right? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a solid technology. Um, yeah, awesome. Thank you guys. That's Thank why those. many of the, the legacy um, equipment makers would, would kind of kept their, you know, they, they obviously weren't trying to digitize or, you know, I'm sure in some cases, there's a lot of people who feel like, okay, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But right. that's kind of where, um, you know, now telephone operations are trying to shut down their, their PSTN lines. And, uh, you know, there are some even some, some mandates coming up fairly soon where we will see PSTN go away altogether. So. Oh, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Um, I've got a slide here. I'm just going to pop up for a second on um, some of the different, uh, I wouldn't call it technologies, uh, just some of the different sure. hardware or, or, yeah, technologies that uh, pop lines run through. So. I'm sure most of you watching probably recognize something that you interact with, uh, at least fairly frequently. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a surprising number of uh, of technologies are are still powered by POTS. Uh, yeah, it was, when I first started here, I had no idea that elevator uh, call lines 
you know, where the still class, still ran mm -hmm. on Fox. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was definitely in a similar position of of coming here and learning just how many um, how many applications still rely on this technology. Uh, it's really incredible. Yeah. Absolutely. Elevator. I, I was surprised to hear that like the emergency call boxes were still yeah. something that was, mm -hmm. was right. kind of that. And, yeah, and probably where we see a lot of, um, you know, still relying on it are alarm systems because those have been in place. Um, yeah, it's yeah. almost like anything that came up, um, you know, came up and, and made their innovations in the early 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. um you know utilize pots lines but then they just kind of stopped right or yeah. even people mm -hmm. have just put things in place and just haven't really um updated them as well um you know most pos or the credit card machines most of those are fully digital now but you know mm -hmm. some, some stores have gone back and uh you know they they re remained on pstn as well most ATMs have switched, but at the same time, you know, in all of these cases, you know, most of the equipment has moved on, but mm -hmm. at the same time, there are still some. And if you have something in place, maybe it's something where you, you cannot um, make some kind of upgrade. So you're kind of stuck with that legacy equipment. Then, right. then you know, in that case, it kind of makes sense to figure out a way to still kind of keep that POTS like connection, but mm -hmm. at the same time, not have to rely on actual POTS itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll, uh, we'll hop on to our next question here, uh, which I'll uh, position to you first, Jacob. Uh, why should organizations choose cellular for wireline? Reliability. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we, we, often say uh, you can't get a wireless connection with a backup. Um, whenever you were talking about replacing something as reliable as copper and as reliable these spot signs is, we need something that is equally as reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and in today's day and age, I know um, over the past years, everyone has complained about, you know, shoddy cell phone service and things like that, but it, it's really um, everywhere and it's really, really reliable. And, mm -hmm. and even in events where um, systems do go down. There are backups for those backup systems. Um, so it, it pretty much is just the most reliable connection um, that is still very scalable and is still widely available in today's day and age. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, same question to you, Dee Dee. Uh, why should organizations choose cellular over uh, wireline? Well, the thing that we're finding with cellular, and and you know, I'm two years at Cradle Point, so I'm relatively newcomer um, considering. But at the same time, uh, you know, wireline is available in some places, but other places it's it's just not accessible, and right. that's something that we're hearing over and over again. Um, we keep as we talk to customers, we find that there are islands of unconnectability. You know, for example, certain cities or certain suburbs or something along those lines where everything around them have some kind of broadband connection. But in that area, there's just nothing to be had. Um, the other thing about cellular is it just really gives you agility. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you do not have to wait for wires to connect you. Um, right. You know, the earliest we, I've heard is like 10 days to get a wired connection. And that's like, you know, you know, but if, if you're yeah, continually <laughs> moving, that's, mm -hmm. you know, 10 days, you know, that's just not very agile. But the thing right. is, cellular mm -hmm. gives you that agility to deploy things very quickly to get, you know, to have it be in the location. It doesn't have to be plugged in or close to it. I mean, think about all that we have benefited from wireless LAN once Wi-Fi has come into play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would anyone go back to plugging into Switch if you're not a gamer? You know, <laughs> it's right. it's kind of like, um, you know, the latency has has really gone down. You know, so there's there's a lot of reasons why to consider wireless WAN. Um, and it really is in terms of giving you the reach that you couldn't have with wires. Um, the agility you couldn't have with wires and which ultimately results in the freedom to network where the business needs, not where, you know, the wires dictate. So, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, actually one more thing on, on why wireless, which um, I'm sure if we have any security people watching today, they're, they're probably um, gnawing their fingers off that we didn't mention um, how secure wireless is. I, they, mm -hmm. That's the 
one of the best, if not the best reasons to use wireless instead of a wired line connection. Um, and that's one of the reasons why pod signs are still where they are today in fire alarms, panic button security systems is because um, you can't hack into a fire alarm uh, right. unless you are physically at that cable. So um, whenever it comes to putting a fire alarm on your main internet system versus um, putting it in its own separated environment where it doesn't touch anything else, that is definitely where you want to be at because um, having a fire alarm be a system that you can get into as a LAN point on your connection is, is not really where you want to be from a security standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and also just to kind of riff off of what you're saying about security, I mean, in many cases, you know, the um, at least with Cradle Point, we've really built in multi-layer of security. There's security mm -hmm. built into the platforms itself locally, there's connections to the cloud itself, and um, there's even cellular security called APNs. And so as long as you have, you know, you have that possibility of doing um, cellular security, that is something that even goes above and beyond what you can you can tap into from a wired perspective as well. But then the other thing you were talking about, it's security and reliability. and mm -hmm. The reliability is, you know, let's say there is some kind of unforeseen event, some, you know, either man-made or naturally occurring. Um, one of the first lines of communication to reemerge is cellular. It's it's not oh, yeah. necessarily, you know, you will have to wait. Um, I've had customers talk about how in uh, New Orleans after the, the last hurricane, they still have customers who are still operating 100% on cellular because that's the only way that they can they can uh, still operate their business, so. Right, yeah, I uh, we had a webinar on Tuesday where I shared, uh, I was actually uh, living in Gatlinburg when we had the fires in 2017 or 2018. I, I honestly can't remember now, might have 2016. But um, yeah, uh, I remember seeing like the Verizon trucks rolling in while everything was still smoking, you know, just to get temp at least temporary networks set up while they made repairs to the to the main networks. But uh, yeah, we had cellular within, you know, within a day, probably, I would say, of like the main event actually happening. And then uh, wireline took quite a bit longer. I remember it might've been like a week to possibly a little more, uh, it's a little fuzzy, but uh, yeah. And even in Nashville, um, you know, a year ago, there was a man-made um, natural disaster. And, you know, in Nashville, you know, we had a number of customers come to us and ask for, for units to get their businesses up and running again in, in downtown Nashville. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that was uh, that was wild as well. Um, cool. So uh, we'll move on to the next question. With that, um, Jacob, what does the uh, R&D team at RCN do? Oh, uh, the research and development team at RCN, um, believe it or not, does a lot of research and development um, of various <laughs> products. Uh, the uh, they've designed the the pots on replacement kit uh, that we sell today. Um, we're always innovating, always trying to find out the best ways to do things, the most reliable ways to do things, and also the most secure way to do those things um, while still trying to keep it affordable for the customer. Um, and so uh, they're making a lot of great strides, not just in Potsline, but also in um, portable network services and many, many other things. Mm -hmm. So really, really exciting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know we do a lot with Cradle Point, but I'm going to save that for uh, a future question here. So. Um, I'll just uh, move on to our next one. So uh, what is RCN's solution to pot line replacement? So uh, Jacob, I'll actually uh, push this one to you again. Yeah, absolutely. So RCN solution is um, partnering with Cradle Point to be able to get that LTE or even maybe one day 5G um, connectivity into our kit um, along with a, um, along with a uh, land to category or RJ11 converter to be able to um, plug into any of the sources directly into um, a wireless device and then directly out to the cell tower from there, completely contained um, with a backup battery. So that way in the event that there's a power outage or in the event um, that anything happens physically whatsoever, um, your phone lines or your fax lines or any of that source, especially if they're driving voltage from that piece, which uh, we also do provide out of our kit, um, is still totally capable of making an emergency phone call. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we sort of, uh, you know, gave, gave the secret away a little bit there, but uh, 
How does uh, Cradle Point come into play? Uh, Didi, I'll uh, position this one to you. Sure, absolutely. So Cradle Point is, is kind of the, the Cradle Point inside part of the, the solution kit that RCN pulls together. But the, um, RCN is a very valuable partner in enabling Cradle Point to you know, deliver this type of solution. Uh, you know, because it's it's Cradle Point is the the routing piece that will you know create and maintain the cellular connectivity. It mm -hmm. has you know cellular and uh, um, you know intelligence into it. It also has um, security capabilities. But um, you know, at the same time, it's not the entire solution, and that's where RCN comes to play because there are. Other things that need to happen in there in terms of, you know, making that connection to analog devices. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something that that RCN um, adds to what Cradle Point provides. And then mm -hmm. it um, also, there is also, you know, once you um, have that analog capability and you're connected, there are certain things that, um, you know, PBXs used to do that somehow need to be replicated again. And that's something that, that RCN is able to provide above and beyond the cellular routers that, that Cradle Point has as well. And then it's also kind of putting those things into play, having the, the um, network operations center, you know, those kind of things are there from RCN. But, mm -hmm. you know, basically Cradle Point is the, the capability that once the, the conversion has made to digital, then then Cradle Point can kind of take it from there, um, serve as a router, be able to do um, Ethernet switching, um, security routing capabilities, and connect to the you know the cellular tower. And then once it's from there, you know everything operates as if it were digital, and you know um, you know completely replaced. Um, mm -hmm you know, whatever was needed with that that PSTN into the, the legacy equipment, or in some cases, there are still some voice or fax lines that need to be replaced, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to pop up the, um, see where is it here? I want to talk about the, uh, the credit point solution that's actually in our kit, um, by the way. And one, uh, one of the cool things about this are, is a lot of the uh, the features that kind of come with Cradle Point and um, just in general, right? So, uh, Didi, can you kind of walk us through what we're looking at here? Sure, sure. This is um, our I IoT router, which is um, for the IBR two hundred series, and and this router is one thing. It's one part of our portfolio. We have mm -hmm. routers that fit for IoT scenarios. We have routers that fit for enterprise branch that can, you know, have significant performance, um, you know, even up to two gigs of, of performance mm -hmm. using cellular and using 5G. Um, so, so, you know, this is kind of a very small entry point router that will fit for this scenario. But believe me, if if cellular is something you would like to talk to RCN about, we um, Cradle Point has an entire portfolio for not only IoT but mobile, and then also enterprise branch that has, you know, can really match and and exceed what you would find from from regular broadband or, and even cable. Um, and with 5G, that's even starting to get into the realm of what you would need for for um, fiber as well. But what you see there is you can see that it's what's amazing about this is all the power you can do in that tiny form factor of the IBR 200 series. And it's in this case, because it's IOT, it's um, it's semi ruggedized is what it's called. And so it's really compact. It's a little bit more durable. It's something that if it's in like, you know, near an elevator or if it's near, you know, if it's in kind of something where there's dust or other kinds of things, it, it still will continue to operate as well. And that's that's the great thing about this particular form factor. Um, and then, um, you know, just for your reference, um, some of our mobile routers um, are considered, um, you know, they're rated to be ruggedized. Well, this one is not quite to that, but, you know, it does um, go into more temperature extremes, things along those lines. Um, you know, it has 
limited security on this particular model. However, if you if security is a concern, other models will have more um, security capabilities as well. You can see the 60 megabits per second firewall throughput. It doesn't seem that much, but if you compare that to PSTN, that's like really opening up the throttle as yeah. well. <laughs> so, yeah, so you know, but keep in mind, if you're just trying to do a quick replacement and you want to have something near the analog device, this this gives you the very basic performance. There are other things if you need more performance that, you know, it's, it's certainly possible as well. And the other thing I would say um, about this is it's not just the hardware itself. You know, I've gone on and on about the hardware, but it's really, um, the, the, you know, the thing that makes things, makes this amazing is the fact that you have NetCloud. NetCloud oh, yes. not only, um, not you know, not only manages the I, IBR200 series, but anything that plugs into the IBR200 series, it has in-band management. So you're able to even, monitor you know some of the devices and do some very basic troubleshooting to devices that plug into the one ethernet port that this device has so yeah definitely uh and just just so you know there was a fly that landed as, as i was shooing so just you know just in case that was misinterpreted or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh no that's awesome yeah i really love uh credit points got a fantastic um just uh, array of, of devices. Uh, and I know, uh, Jacob, you've got some experience, obviously, with a lot of those devices. So that kind of brings us into our next question, uh, if you don't mind me switching here. Uh, what is the relationship between RCN and Cradle Point? Yeah, so uh, RCN and Cradle Point have been partnered for, I think, about eight years now. Um, we are a uh, reseller for them. We are a partnership up with them. Um, we work very closely with them, with all of their SEs and their engineers. Um, to ensure we're always providing the right solution, to ensure we're always at the forefront of what this technology is capable of, um, and to always ensure that we're giving our customers what they need. Credit mm -hmm. um, is a fan, absolutely <clears throat> fantastic solution whenever it comes to cellular. Um, no better in the market, to be honest. And uh, yeah, uh, they offer us a lot of resources, not just in terms of you know giving us information to be able to give our customers what they need, but also in terms of education um, and in terms of fun even uh uh credit point has just been an absolutely fantastic partner for the past eight years yeah absolutely uh i do want to ask you um can you uh say a little bit about the um the new certification that you've received as well as the certification that rcn holds received yeah um so i just most recently got my credit point expert certification um so new ish uh because credit point has actually redone entirely how they've done their certification so before um, it was an in-house lab. Now it's uh, it's all virtual, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's just got a ton more material. Um, it, it's taught absolutely phenomenally. Um, the material is fantastic. Uh, a lot of a lot of really high-level networking um, protocols. A lot of high-level networking configurations. Um, I've never seen put as simply as I did whenever I was in this course. Um, so that was the most recent one that I received, and then. Uh, before that, uh, RCN as a whole has been 5G certified through Cradle Point. Uh, so what we had to do for that was uh, a bunch of paperwork. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no we actually uh, we actually had to get shipped 5G um, devices, W2005 and W4005, and be able to um, show that we were capable of installing this device, capable of configuring and getting it set up to be able to optimize that 5G network and provide that actually to the building we're in right now. Um, and then once we were able to do that and get that inspected, um, we were uh, very humbly received our uh, 5G certification, which means that um, RCN is capable of installing um, any of the 5G equipment that Cradle Point offers at your business. Yeah, yeah. If you want to see those uh, devices, if, if you guys are in the Knoxville area, I'm not sure uh, who else on on the call right now, but uh, just drive on by. You can see them on on our roof. They're they're real pretty up there in white. Uh, you know, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I, I hear it's quite the light show at night, actually, really? um, you can see them quite well. <laughs> no, and that's so, it's so wonderful to hear you talk about it because, you know, Cradle Point has, you are part of one of the elite partners with Cradle Point because of all the extra certifications that you've, you've done. 
and you know you've utilized Cradle Point University, and that enables you to really be um, to to really support our products, and that's just mm -hmm. um, massively important in in making sure our our mutual customers have what they need to have a positive experience with their cellular. So that's that's fabulous to hear. Now, Jacob, what is what is something you learned? in the course of becoming that expert? What is something about cellular or about cradle point or something that came out of that course that, um, you know, or even about 5G that you learned that, um, you know, you could share with all of us? Yeah, um, so uh, I've, I've been learning a ton about 5G over the past, I guess, just year. I mean, I wanted to say years, um, cause that's what it's felt like, but uh, it's really still quite new. Um, so absolute ton that I've learned about that, um, and uh, I think uh, I think your guys' course, the uh, 5G professional network uh, that you guys have, go into that really, really well, especially when it comes to the nuances of not just how the technology is affecting the device itself and how that affects that customer, but even the nuances of how the technology works and what it's doing even in the air, which gives us a lot of insight into um, how that behavior is happening and kind of gives us that that extra edge to be able to know when problems occur, how those problems could be occurring from a whole different standpoint. Um, but I'd say the most interesting thing um, that I really didn't know about um, going into the expert course was all of your guys' API integrations. Um, you know, I know when a lot of people hear that term at home, they think really scary walls of code, um, but it's really quite simple. Um, CradlePoint makes it extremely simple through their platform and cloud manager to be able to integrate into their API and to be able to access that SDK to be able to um, do all kinds of things that really uh, are, are completely off manual. And um, uh, there's so many resources out there where a lot of those modules are pre-built to be able to do all mm -hmm. kinds of really fun specific features. Um, and uh, I was shocked at how easy it was to, um, to do a lot of those pre-builds. Of course, you can also just get as complicated as you want with it. <laughs> yeah, and then just kind of carrying on the theme of both POTS integration and the APIs that you were just talking about. If, you, you know, what it does is it means that you can put more of the applications that typically may have to be in a, a data center or in the cloud, but you can put it closer on the router itself. And so if you need to kind of put some kind of software to run those legacy equipment and have it closer so you don't have any le um, latency in there. That's one way that you can do that. And that's something that you've just learned how to how to do it. And, and so maybe that's something that can really tie into the POTS line, you know, as, as well as connecting into so, you know, some of that legacy equipment that's still, um, you know, this is one way of kind of continuing to keep that legacy equipment going and, and maintain that investment, but at the same time, give a little value add to make it work better because it's, it's, you know, it's actually closer to the device itself, so. Yeah, definitely. There are some, uh, some great answers there. Um, Didi, I've got a slide about Cradle Point if you want me to throw it up here, if you don't mind uh, talking on this real quick. Uh, sure. All right, so uh, something about the leader in enterprise wireless plan. Yeah, exactly. So, if, so for those of you who are not familiar with Cradle Point, Cradle Point has been around since 2006, so it's about 15 years old. And um, it started off um, differently than most. It started off um, a bit more prosumer, but once our, our current CEO, George Mulhern, came to the um, forefront, front, um, he, he, he really shifted us in um, an enterprise direction. And so, um, so you'll see that we have, today we have over 28,000 active cu customers. Um, and that's, you know, using NetCloud to monitor um, 1.6 million endpoints under subscription. And we are available worldwide. Um, so, um, you know, even to the point of, of, you know, in Asia PAC, in South Africa, we were on a call yesterday with South Africa. So, so this is something that it's not just... Um, you know, something in Boise, Idaho, which is the headquarters, it's it's something available um, worldwide. And where we've really gotten our start has been with retail customers. Um, so you can see that 75% of, of 
top worldwide real real retailers <laughs> are use cradle point and uh, you know when i was at nrf the Nat national retail um foundation show in new york two years ago um a lot of the retailers came up and they already knew who we were you know it's something that we're part of the solutions whether it's providing them primary connections for cellular or a lot of us use it a lot of them use us for failover as well just making sure that nothing goes down um, so that they are continuing to make sales no matter what we work very closely with a lot of first responders and second responders and public agencies as well. So as you see, we're in the top 25 US cities, whether we're in the fire department, the police department, um, or um, some type of emergency services. We also have US, um, but not only US, um, also, you know, in Canada, we're, we're working in Canada and um, Europe as well with public agencies and as well as in Europe and Asia Pacific as well. Um, we're in, in um, Fortune 100 um, and mostly what we do is we work with branch scenarios or mobility or in some cases IoT scenarios. But at the same time, we are providing cellular connections so that we can help extend the reach of that Fortune 100 um, to going where wires cannot really um, connect them. And then yeah. of the Fortune 500, you know, similarly, you know, we're, we're highly involved, so. That's excellent. That is a, a great resume for, uh, for the company as well as, uh, as yours. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So um, let's see, I think we've got one or two questions left. It's uh, 2.34, so yeah, we'll, we'll get moving on these. Um, what does cutting the cord look like? Um, Jacob, I'll actually uh, ask you this first. Oh, a mess. No, uh, <laughs> it can, it can, you know, a lot of these um, hotlines are, are very old and they've been in place for a very long time. Things have been put between them. Things have been put on top of them, below them, um, you know, as technology has just sort of evolved around it like a time lapse. Um, and so a lot of the times um, going in there, it, it does require a lot of expertise to be able to know really what you're going for, what you're actually cutting, what needs to be cut, what needs to be replaced, um, what can go. And uh, so I, I think that's where um, it's really, really important to, to have somebody who knows what they're doing, looking at those systems whenever we're dealing with life safety, especially um, to be able to remove those systems from, um, from a consumer point of view, I would say um, uh, you get to uh, purchase the Potslime replacement kit, um, give us a little bit of information and then uh, decide a day for us to go in and uh, get it taken care of, which is a really good deal, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Dee, same question to you. I'll actually pop this, uh, this slide that you gave us on the screen. Uh, but what do you think uh, cutting the cord looks like for, for businesses and, and organizations? Well, for the, there's probably the best way to think about it is there's a spectrum of, of what is possible. And, you know, for those of you who have kept an, a legacy equipment around and have been tethered to that, that analog um, POTS line, um, I'm sure you're just trying to keep things as is. And really cutting the cord will keep that legacy equipment as it was. It just will be a lot less expensive because the PSTN lines are getting more and more expensive. But once, um, if, if you are, you know, thinking about it, then as you're kind of moving into your digital future, there's a lot of things that are possible to really support your business or organization. So uh, cutting the cord and becoming digital means that you can, um, you know, utilize everything that's available for the internet. And you can do that within fixed locations. So if you're in a branch office or a store or something where typically it has been wired, but at the same time, what we're seeing with a lot of customers is that they're getting shorter leases They're you know, so they may be more mobile and more, you know, um, you know, transitory. So, so, so even if you're in a fixed building, it may be that you need to restructure things as well. The other thing is like 24 by seven operations. There's a ways of using redundant routers in um, 24 by seven operations where you can have a redundant router in, in place 
And so that way, if you need to do maintenance, um, you do not um, have any downtime. And, and that's something you can do with cradle point routers as well. Another thing that we're used for is um, day one expansion. So that way, if you um, need to open some uh, new location quickly, you don't have to wait 10 days or sometimes up to three months to open. Um, what we hear from our customers all the time is that they're able to you know, turn on as soon as the power is up, then they, they've automatically got a connection. So, so that means a path to revenue much more quickly as well. Um, you know, much like we were talking about with the day one expansion or temporary sites, you know, um, construction trailers, um, if you need to, for education, if you need to establish a mobile classroom um, up sooner rather than later, uh, if, if it's something where um, because of COVID you need to um, expand your footprint somehow, you know, it's something that you can quickly and, you know, get your, your, your area networked very quickly and then um, shut it off as soon as it's no longer needed as well. In rural locations, you absolutely positively need to depend upon um, cellular because I can tell you fiber will not be there. And so, so that's an area where um, having, having cellular and, you know, many of you may think, oh, what I get on my phone is the same experience. It is not because RCN and Cradle Point work with many um, antenna vendors and these antenna vendors, are, you know, someone, the quote I love is someone said, I can set up a pop-up in the middle of the Florida Everglades and still get a great signal. You know, so you can be in the middle of nowhere and still manage to get a signal. So, so that's the important thing. Um, we mentioned pop-up sites. That's another way of kind of extending your reach if you need to have something temporary. Um, another thing that we see also is something called, we call it store in store. So um, if you want to set up a business within a Walmart or Walgreens or, you know, a lot of larger retailers, you certainly are not going to tap into their network, so you need to supply right. your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's becoming more common too, um, from what I'm seeing. But uh, there was uh, two points that you mentioned. I, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget uh, that I wanted to kind of go over. Um, the first one with the antennas. Um, yeah, that was a great point. So you think about you know your smartphone. Uh, it has to fit an antenna in there with like a battery and the chip card and cameras and and all the stuff that's in your phone, right? Whereas uh, some of the uh, antennas, like what's in our pop-up network kit, is almost the size of Jacob's head, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you're definitely going to get uh, quite a different experience out of that. Um, and then the second thing uh, you said at the beginning was uh, some of the line architecture. And it reminded me when uh, we were talking about the uh, POTS over LTE kit, Jacob, I don't think we mentioned this. Um, the way that ours works, uh, without getting too much into detail, it kind of just plugs into your 66 block and then you're good to go. So there's no digging up, you know, any existing lines. There's no tearing anything out, replacing it. It's like a super simple install, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and ultimately, I mean, that's what we want to provide for you. I mean, if you've mm -hmm. kept that, that infrastructure for this long, then chances are you just want something to be seamless. And that's, that's ultimately what the solution is. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So with that, uh, I think we'll move on to our next question here. Let's see. Oh, it's a final question. All right. So um, this is a question for both of you. What is one thing you would say to organizations that are considering replacing their POTS lines? Uh, Jacob, I'll start with you. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I really feel like we're, we're, we're always a little hot and cold about this. We say, you know, don't wait too long. Um, but I would also say don't rush into it. Um, mm -hmm. I would say really know what you're doing um, and um, try to try to get an idea of what you might be dealing with before um, we come in there definitely mm -hmm. um, because sorry fly just landed on me <laughs> start uh, <laughs> um, you know we're absolutely the experts um, but uh, we also need to know you know what what's being relied on for this so that way we can mm -hmm. know what's used and what isn't used because in a lot of situations we'll actually go in uh, most i would say i don't think we've had a single one yet where we haven't actually had customers who have canceled box lines as a result of this because um, up to 25 or even 30 percent of the ones they have in house weren't even being utilized at the time mm -hmm. um, so we really need to know what's important and what's not um, uh, but more than that um, i would just say 
um, do your research, start the start the conversation early. Um, but uh, I wouldn't say that there, uh, there there's not a fire spreading to get rid of this immediately, but definitely want to be doing it within the next, I'd say, three to four months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dee, Dee I, um, yeah, same question. Yeah, you definitely don't want to wait. We know that the um, deadline is coming up, and that's like August 2nd, I believe, of 2022. And so, you know, but you don't want to wait until that date. You want to start mm -hmm. start the discussions now. And but at the same time, give yourself plenty of time to make that migration be be a graceful one. You know, don't you know, don't fit, do it in a rushed way so that it, you know, it causes some kind of disruption. You know, so that's the idea. And our goal, our mutual goal is to help you replace your POTS lines, but do it in a way that's cost effective, which it will be, because, you know, if you're still paying out all that money for POTS lines, you know, I can promise you that the solution will pay for itself in a few months. Um, so so it's, it's going to, you know, give you a bit more operating capital, um, you know, to do other things and possibly even use that money to help digitize the rest of your business as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the direction everything's moving in for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would say um, to that degree as well. Um, I know I started it, but I, I couldn't agree more to start the conversation early. Um, you know, we, we kind of pose it as a, it is it is pulling out a wire, you know, cutting it and plugging it in. But there there's a lot of work that goes into it beforehand and locating your points and right. um, trying to find out where everything is going and making sure we have everything lined up with what you need um, before we start, you know, snipping away. Um, and so having a lot of those plans, having a lot of that conversation and um, knowing everything we can before getting in there is uh, just so, so imperative to the process. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with uh, with both of your answers. Um, one thing I want to say too, is that the uh, the August 2nd deadline, you know, we definitely don't want to misre misrepresent it and say everything's going to get shut down. But after that point, you know, no new pot plans are going to be issued. So um, you're going to be going to some sort of alternate solution anyway, if you're expanding or, you know, getting new, uh, picking up new businesses, or uh, even if, you know, uh, maybe one of your pot lines fails or, you know, um, there's, I don't know, just uh, an act of nature, right, takes it down. Uh, maybe your provider's not servicing it anymore because they're going to want to get existing customers off of there. So uh, prices will likely go up even more uh, once we reach that point. Uh, services are going to decline. So you really don't want to wait until that point to start, um, you know, looking at replacements. Uh, but at the same time, it's not like they're going to shut it off on that date. So I know a lot of time it, it might seem that way. So I just wanted to make sure we weren't misrepresenting anything. Um, awesome. So, so Mark so, and, and yeah. Jacob, you know, maybe you should throw out the the um, figures about how much, you know, how much POTS lines have been costing people lately. Yes. Oh, you know what? We had talked about that and I meant to put that in this presentation. So uh, we did a, a, a poll um, on our LinkedIn page and I believe the average was 50 to $100 per line per month. So yeah, whenever, wow. you know, how, when you're doing some of these replacements, how many lines, you know, do people have at, at one location? You know, oh, I mean, what's an example? Yeah, I was going to say very much depends on the business, but yeah. I mean, um, we've done, um, we've done site surveys for places that have um, over 600 POTS lines and we've done site surveys for people that have, you know, up to just 10 in yeah. a particular location. Mm -hmm. But like I said, not a single one that we found um, that doesn't have unutilized POTS lines that are still being paid for there. Right, yeah, and uh, on, on the webinar on Tuesday, which I'll actually be sharing on our uh, social media uh, if you are interested in watching it, um, they had talked about one of their customers on the West Coast paying something like over $1,000 per month on their POTS. Yeah, it was wild, it was wild. So uh, rates are definitely going up quite quite substantially on that, um, and it is really across the board. Um, do, you, do you have any insight actually onto whether, um, We've kind of talked about this before about if certain regions um, are more prone to price increases or more prone to replacement or anything like that. Well, one of the things that we were, you know, we wanted to hear from from all of you is um, we we've heard about the you know people staying with their pots lines a, a little bit more in the the northeast and and even in the southeast. Um, so that's where we've heard it. We've heard it a little bit less in, for example, the Southwest, you know, that one's a, a bit coming up. And so by the time it was as populated, 
um, you know, other types of technologies were in use rather than than having the pods right. lined itself. Um, but, you know, that's what we've heard. I'm also interested in hearing kind of the areas that you guys are running across in terms of, uh, you know, finding out the, of, of working with POTS lines and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, so are you in, are you saying in terms of um, just what, what's the average of what we're seeing? Do we see a difference between different regions, that sort of thing? Exactly, like the the density of those who are still on POTS lines versus those who are um, a bit more on digital digital lines at this point. Absolutely. I mean, um, age really has everything to do with it. it it's not surprising mm -hmm. that the West is, we see a lot less of that just because a lot of the infrastructure there is just newer. Um, you know, whenever you get into the New England area and the, the entire East Coast, you're talking about some of the oldest places in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of those places developed first and got the POTS lines first and, um, you know, really got attached to them first. So I, I, we absolutely see a higher frequency of those down here um, than you would see in other places, which mm -hmm. are much more open to, you know, ripping and replacing early and looking for alternatives to inundated technologies. Um, but I mean, as far as customers that utilize it more, um, health and safety is really the biggest one because of that security factor that we mm -hmm. talked about. Um, there are tons of places today that just still need that POTS to rely on or because of that, they need a solution to be able to replace it. Um, so that's probably the biggest area. Um, transportation is an odd one in a lot of the um, locations that we see. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the two big ones. There's not a whole lot of, um, there's not a whole lot of you know small pop-up shots that you see this with, but there are a ton of uh, retailers who own multiple retails across the country. Most mm -hmm. of them have one to three pot signs inside of them for yeah. fire alarms, uh, panic buttons, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you'll be you'll be hard pressed to find a business that's not using pot signs, honestly. Yeah, yeah, at least one of a certain age. I think yeah. newer ones aren't really utilizing right. it. Right. But, um, it is, I, I, if anything, it's it's really shocking how many places actually still happen. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the stats that I've seen recently was that there are still 36 million POTS lines in place, so. Yeah, that is wild. Yeah, a year ago, I might not have believed that, honestly. <laughs> but now it's, it doesn't seem shocking at all. <laughs> Well, it's funny because I, I had been dealing with this topic back in, you know, early 2000s. And so so when this topic came back up again, I'm like, really, we're still dealing with this? So, Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. So that's cost, lack of support, lack of visibility, FCC deadline. Those are all great reasons, um, you know, to replace your POTS lines. Absolutely. But great. So, um, all right. So questions and answers. Let's get to this segment here. I'll stop sharing the screen so we can talk full screen. Uh, number one, how reliable is the POTS over LTE solution? Jacob, this seems right up your alley. Absolutely. Very. You know, we, I think we've, uh, we've talked about it during this entire webinar, but it, it really is the best solution whenever it comes to, um, POTS line replacement, you know, um, we, we want to do everything we can to make it as simple and as seamless for you, the customer as possible. But, um, even if uh, even if you don't decide to go with our CN, um, we'll we'll be a little sad. But at the same time, I really can't stress the importance enough that it needs to be wireless and it needs to be something a lot more reliable than just mm -hmm. plugging it up to your main ISP in your business for sure. Yeah. So. Um, extremely, extremely reliable. <laughs> and, and I would say, you know, just to put some details behind, you know, the, the reliability, you know, Cradle Point in the early days kind of reverse engineered how to make the cellular connections. And, you know, um, that was something that we did on our own with our own engineering. But at the same time, now that we're working with Ericsson, we can actually open the kimono and see how, how cellular is created. But so uh, Cradle Point has really taken a lot of time to build something that we're starting to call in cellular intelligence. And it's something where we've understood how to make a connection, how to maintain a connection. And, um, you know, when it comes time for certification with with carriers, we we typically have a much easier time based on our research, engineering, and dedication to building in that cellular connectivity. We will add, you know, we will have kind of like the cellular chips, but then we add a lot of firmware onto that, which based on kind of our knowledge and our 
our intellectual property in terms of understanding, um, you know, and every day we dedicate our engineering into how do we simplify connecting cellular for those people who are not as familiar with cellular. Um, right. so, so the idea is that that way we really build into it a lot of knowledge and capability and then take the guesswork out of um, how do you maintain it? How do you establish things as well? But really, you know, we hear over and over from our customers of you just connected and it just works. And so that yeah. makes our day. So yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So uh, number two, do you think, do any of you think the FCC will extend its deadline? Uh, great question. Um, I know it's already been extended once, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, again, kind of to my previous point, um, you know, everything's not going to get shut down right when the deadline hits. But um, I think there's a, a very real chance it's probably just it's going to keep. Um, Didi, do you have any insight possibly into uh, into how that might go one way or the other? I mean, it's it's government, so it's hard to gauge where that that's actually going to land. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say, um, you know, it's been um, postponed one time, but I would say it's looking good. It, it's, it really is in the hands of the carriers, is, is in my impression, right, you know, yeah. because they're trying to divest of their PSTN um, investments. So that way they have the opportunity to build more digital things and, and do innovations. And so, so I think that if they... Um, you know, if they feel confident that they can switch it off without causing any kind of an undue harm, then I think that they will move forward with this um, August deadline. If not, then um, then there, we could see a potential extension. So any thoughts right. from you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't expect that they will, um, Any, especially since they've already extended it once. And, and you know, we've, we've said it a lot, but... Mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest thing, right? Is that the FCC isn't telling the carriers to start cutting lines as soon as that, yeah. um, as soon as midnight strikes on that day, like New Year's Eve. Uh, it is, um, they're still very much going to be available as far as I know. Um, I didn't see any reason why they would all get shut off because um, it, it's kind of a win win for the carrier where, you know, they get to continue charging and also don't really have a responsibility to uphold it if anything went, went yeah. wrong with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I don't think there's any advantages to cutting that off, and I don't right. think there's much of an advantage for the FCC to extend that deadline again, unless something yeah. else happens between then and there, um, which. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. Yeah, the only thing I'll say with that, um, kind of to your point, Dee, Dee uh, with the carriers is, I mean, if, if they know it's coming, if they know the deadline's coming, whether it's extended or not, you know, they're moving in the direction of not doing pop lines anymore, so. Um, Kind of like we're already seeing, you know, line um, line rates are going to go up. Uh, lack of service is going to keep happening. You know, to your point, really. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, there's no reason to wait. Essentially, is is kind of what I think we're all getting at here. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So, with three minutes left, let's get this last question. Uh, how is the RCN slash credit point solution different from the other available options? Uh, Jacob, this might be a good uh, good one for you. Oh gosh, I, I don't <laughs> I don't know if this terms. Uh... Oh, this isn't copyrighted by Intel, but yeah. uh, you know it's what's inside, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, D, you've you've done a fantastic job of really um, explaining why Cradle Point is so trustworthy in this mm -hmm. space, why it's so important to go with Cradle Point for your cellular your cellular networking needs. So many other solutions out there. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 knowing what the backbone is, and we're perfectly willing to say, you know, we're using. Um, this device because it's simply the best um, and because we want to provide the most reliable solution. Mm -hmm. um, and in any given scenario, we're always going to want to continue to improve that solution and, and try to make it work for the customer as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and just to add to that, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, just in what I heard you say, really it's the integrity of the partner you choose and the fact that yeah. you are, Selecting, you know, try making sure that you're providing the best solution possible within the price points of of the customer, you know, and and that's by choosing the right partner, you know, yeah. with the integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see. I think we're we're good to uh, to wrap up here now. I just want to make sure we uh, we stay on time with everything. 
I'm going to pop this poll up on the screen. Uh, it's just how do we do today? It's a one to five star uh, quiz. Um, pretty simple. One star you didn't enjoy it, five stars you did. So thank you for, uh, for whoever's already voted five star pretty quick. Uh, like that reaction speed, definitely. Um, but no, uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, here is a link where you can go and take advantage of that one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar. As rcntechnologies.com slash cut the cord. Um, but with this, I mean, we've reached the end of our presentation. Didi, Jacob, do you guys have any parting words for our audience today? I know we've covered a lot, a lot of ground. No, thank you for your time. Appreciate, appreciate the attention. Yeah. Pat, I don't think I have anything. Awesome. Well, uh, cool. Well, then with that, uh, thank you both Jacob and Didi. Uh, you guys have been excellent today on, on this topic. Really, uh, like I said, we've covered a ton of ground. And then thank you to everyone who uh, stuck around and watched. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.